unexpected week off, the Cup guys are headed to the Magic Mile. But for some teams, there's nothing magical about it. And it's been one of the toughest racetracks I've had a race in all year long. I finished third there last year, and uh, it, it was a tough third. Loudon marks the halfway point, so we've got your mid-season look back. We'll tell you who's been leading the way and who's been trailing behind. Plus, we'll talk to Craftsman truck driver Tony Raines, who's already made it to Victory Lane twice this year. And go in focus with Ricky Craven, who's making his Winston Cup return in front of the hometown crowd at Loudon. Just getting back in the car was the priority, and, and it didn't matter where it was. But I think that the circumstances bringing all this together, to begin, you know, the early part of July and being back in New England at a place that I've had some success in front of a lot of friends and family, it's, uh, it's like the perfect script. That's all next inside NASCAR. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for our Saturday edition of Inside NASCAR. I'm joined in the studio this weekend by Stephanie Boyd Derner. NASCAR has a busy weekend. The Winston Cup drivers and teams are at the New Hampshire International Speedway. They'll run there tomorrow afternoon. The Craftsman Truck Series will run at Nazareth, Pennsylvania tomorrow afternoon. And the Bush Series will run at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina tonight. And Stephanie, there's been a lot of rumors going on recently as far as drivers are concerned. There sure have been, Ned, but I think rumors is the operative word here, especially when it comes to Mike Skinner. Skinner found out last weekend just how vicious the rumor mill can be. Word throughout the NASCAR community was that Skinner had been fired from the Lowe's Chevrolet and was being replaced by Ted Musgrave. Team manager David Smith was livid about the speculation and claimed Skinner will be in the 31 throughout the rest of the season. As for Musgrave, both he and Roush Racing have admitted they'll be parting ways and Kevin LePage is now waiting in the wings with his newly signed Roush contract. Another driver change in the works could see 17-year-old sensation Casey Atwood making the jump from Bush Grand National to Winston Cup. Atwood and the LAR Bush team have gone their separate ways, and Atwood recently tested a Cup car for Bill Elliott at Daytona. Rumors had Atwood signing a five-race deal with Elliott, but Elliott's camp says at this point Atwood is only helping them with testing. Also out of the Bush series, add another Earnhardt to the driver roster there. Dale's oldest son and Dale Jr.'s half-brother, Kerry Earnhardt, was scheduled to drive in tonight's Bush Series race at Myrtle Beach, filling in in the Channel Lock Chevy for Kevin LePage, who is at Loudoun. And Blaze Alexander has finally landed a new crew chief. Teddy Lee Brown takes over as head wrench on the number 20 rescue engine Chevy. He moves over from the number 21 Band-Aid Forge driven by Michael Waltrip. Tonight's race at Myrtle Beach will showcase a special paint scheme for Bush driver Tony Stewart. Stewart and all of the Joe Gibbs Racing teams are promoting the Universal Studios film Small Soldiers at various events this year. Bobby Labonte was supposed to drive a Small Soldiers car last week at Daytona, but with the Pepsi 400 postponed until October, Labonte is now scheduled to drive that car at Talladega October 11th. Meanwhile, Ricky Rudd will run a different paint scheme for the August 1st running of the Brickyard 400. Rudd's Ford will honor the Give the Kids the World Village, and his sponsor, Tide, will donate $100 for every lap Rudd completes. And finally, our condolences go out to the family of Bunky Knudsen, the National Commissioner of NASCAR, who passed away on Monday at the age of 85. Knudsen served as NASCAR's final word on all appeals for the past 20 years. And we're glad to hear the folks in Florida received some rain this week. Welcome relief from all those fires which canceled last week's Pepsi 400. Well, thanks, Stephanie. Of course, the Pepsi 400 NASCAR Winston Cup race was smoked out last weekend, but there was a lot of action at the Milwaukee Mile in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Dale Earnhardt came home the winner on Sunday. Yeah, Dale Earnhardt Jr. has been so dominant on the Bush Series this year. This is his first full season. you got to remember that. And that was another one of the tracks that he had never seen this year, but he was so dominant all day. Well, he was awesome. Tyler Potter takes a look back at the Die Hard 250 from Milwaukee. <laughs> The only thing to remember from last week's Bush race in Milwaukee is Dale Earnhardt Jr. Boy, was he dominant in winning his third race of the year. At several points in the race, Earnhardt Jr. had as much as a 20-second lead. A couple of drivers had to drop to the back of the field at the start, Elton Sawyer and Tony Stewart. Sawyer's car failed a post-qualifying inspection when the fuel didn't meet NASCAR standards. Stewart was penalized for missing the driver's meeting. Points leader in Wisconsin native Mac Kenseth got a scare in the early going when he spun and turned four while running in the top ten.
Kent has continued and eventually finished fifth. It was a rough day for another native, Dick Trickle, who was the only Winston Cup driver competing. Engine problems ended his day just 27 laps in. He finished dead last in 41st place. The first race back for Jimmy Foster in the 50 proved to be an adventure. He gets into the wall here in turn three, bringing out the third caution on lap 45. Holes hitter Jeff Purvis took the lead from Earnhardt 10 laps later, but Earnhardt returned the favor to lead it halfway. Junior would lead 208 of the 250 laps in the day to win by some five seconds. Sawyer roared all the way back to finish an amazing second. Purvis was third, while David Green was fourth in just his second race in the 36 car. Kent's fifth place finish was his series leading ninth top five of 98. Tony said the car was going to be good. My crew chief, he said the car was going to be excellent. And he's, uh, he's been right every time this year. And we're pretty happy with the AC Delco Chevrolet Monte Carlo and how the car ran today. Uh, we just uh, put a good whooping on. It, it, uh, it's a driver's dream when you run that good. Oh, you had an awful good car. You know, you can't, ifs and ands, that, that didn't make any difference. But I'm really proud of my race team. Uh, it could have easily just folded yesterday. You know, that was kind of devastating for us. But we uh, we put that behind us. We went and had a good night's dinner and um, came out today and showed what we're made out of. Well, thanks, Tyler. And, Stephanie, the points battle is tightening up now after the Milwaukee race. So let's take a look at those points with the top three very close. Yeah, they sure are. Matt Kenseth led Mike McLaughlin by only 20 points heading into the Milwaukee race. He still leads in by 20, but Dale Earnhardt Jr. made up the most ground. He's only two points behind McLaughlin now. You can see it's a long way back to fourth. Randy LaJoy, the defending series champion, is in that spot, but he's over 300 back from the leader. Now let's take a look at the second five in the point standing. Buckshot Jones heads that up. Tim Fiedel in seventh place and Phil Parsons eighth hanging right in there. The NASCAR Busch Series runs tonight at the Myrtle Beach Speedway in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, a race that you can see live right here on TNN. Phil Wurz has a preview of the race. Ah, Myrtle Beach. The sun, the sand, the thunder of Busch Grand National Racing. You know, last year, heat was the major factor as portions of the track became loose in the late afternoon bait. The forecast is for more heat, but better track conditions Saturday night. Elliot Sadler charged to a second NASCAR Busch Series win at the Advance Owner Parts 250. He also had the pole for the event, and no doubt he knows how to get around the half-mile track in that Phillips 66 Chevy. Easy in, hard off is, is the big thing. That's a slick racetrack. It's there. It gets a lot of sand on it. Uh, it eats your tires up. So the easy, you feel like you're going. You feel like you're going slower, but you're actually going faster about a watt. So uh, that's something I learned at an early age in late model. And uh, I applied it to the Bush call last year. It worked, and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to apply it again this weekend. Dale Earnhardt Jr. carries plenty of momentum to the Grand Strand after his win last Sunday at Milwaukee. Let's see, so far this year, a win on a flat one-miler, super speedway win at Texas, and a win on the high banks at Dover. He's definitely shown he can win anywhere. But with late model experience at Myrtle Beach, Earnhardt is indeed a threat. That was my home track for several years. I got a lot of laughs there, so, um, you know, a lot of these Bush veterans won't have that big of an advantage on me. Uh, we ran one year, uh, one year there, just two, uh, I think two years ago we raced there in the Bush Series. Did pretty well, so look forward to getting back there and, uh, you know, showing, uh, showing the folks at Myrtle Beach what I've been doing for the past couple months. The past couple of weeks have been very successful for David Green. After losing his Winston Cup ride recently, Green has come back to the Bush Series and has claimed two straight fourth place finishes in the Stanley Pontiac for Team 34. Green's last Bush win came in 1996 at Myrtle Beach, where he started from the pole. But the 1994 series champion says there are some subtle differences now at Myrtle Beach. Myrtle Beach got new pavement now. I ran there on the old pavement. So that's going to be a different uh, deal. But you know, again, I got a great teammate, Mike McLaughlin, has had some experience there. My brother Mark in the Timberwolf car. So I'm awful excited to go back there. But you know, it's one of those old sayings, you know, the last time I left Myrtle Beach and Hickory, I won those races. And I always said, well, maybe I won't ever have to go back to Hickory because my record will be good. I'll leave it on a good, clean plate. But now I get to go back to Myrtle Beach, so I got to step up to, to the plate. And I got a great team and a great car and a great sponsor, uh, great engines from Hutter, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So it's going to be tough, but I'm up for the battle. Well, thanks, Phil. That race comes up this evening at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be back to take a look at who we think are favorites to win at New Hampshire tomorrow right after this. Inside NASCAR is brought to you by Propecia. Talk to your doctor today. Are you concerned about losing more hair? Do you want
wonder how much further it will go. Do you wish you could do something about it? Well, now there's a pill for men with certain types of hair loss. Introducing Propecia. In clinical studies, the vast majority of men, 83%, maintain their current hair count, and most, 66%, regrew some hair. Take it daily and you could see results in as little as three months. Propecia is for men only. A small number of men experience certain sexual side effects. Each occurred in less than 2% of men. Women who are or may potentially be pregnant must not use it or handle broken tablets because of the risk of a specific kind of birth defect. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist and read the consumer information they can provide. Propecia, helping make hair loss history. Mission Control, we have a problem. Even in today's high-tech engines, deposits can still diminish power. Dirty fuel system affecting performance. Enter Valvoline Sin Power, a new line of high-performance additives and cleaners. A complete fuel system treatment formulated with component-targeting synthetic molecules that lock on and eliminate those power-robbing deposits. An air mixture, a go. So your engine runs cleaner and performs the way it should. We have it all. Valvoline Sin Power. Rocket science for the road. Major Hazard, you left the base without authorization. Proceeded to Burger King and ordered a rodeo burger? I've served this command for over... Answer third. the question! Did you order the rodeo burger? You're darn right I did. It was flame broiled and delicious. Burger King salutes small soldiers with a tasty new rodeo burger. Cheese, onion rings, bullseye barbecue sauce. Right now, part of the 99-cent great taste menu. That rodeo burger, it was pretty tasty, huh? You can't handle the rodeo burger. If you ask us, it just tastes better. Husky, the toughest name in tools. Guaranteed forever. Available at the Home Depot. The NASCAR Winston Cup drivers and teams are at the New Hampshire International Speedway for the running of the Jiffy Lube 300 tomorrow afternoon. Now, each week we take a look at who we think are favorites to win the race. We base our opinion on their past performance at that racetrack as well as their performance so far this year. And Stephanie Jeff Gordon heads up both of those lists. Yeah, he sure does. He was first in the points heading into this race last year, and he's first in the points heading in this year as well. And he's also got more wins at that track than anybody else with two victories in 95 and in 97. Another guy that runs well there, Mark Martin. He has not won at New Hampshire, but he runs good on that type of racetrack. He has a second place finish there, and he's won some poles there in the past as well. And of course, he goes into the race third in the points. Now, another guy, Jeff Burton, he won the race that last year and looked for him to be strong again. Yeah, it was his second career win after, of course, that breakthrough win at Texas last year. He was fifth in points last year. He's eighth in points heading in this year, but he's had a string of top ten finishes until Sears Point a couple of weeks ago, so basically he's been on a roll with the exception of that race lately. Well, those are the three favorites, and certainly a couple of guys that would deserve honorable mention are Terry Labadie and Dale Jarrett. Now, neither of them have won at the New Hampshire International Speedway, but they run strong on that type of a racetrack. It's very similar to the Richmond International Raceway, where they finished 1-2 last month, so I think they'll be pretty good there. Yeah, and don't forget Ricky Rudd, either. He won at Loudoun in 1994, so he could be strong as well. But the guy we're going to pick as our spoiler this week is Rusty Wallace. He won the very first Winston Cup race at Loudoun back in 1993, and since then, he's had three top five finishes at that track, so he could be strong as well. Yeah, I think he will be. Hey, you be sure to join us here on TNN tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We'll have a live track update. We'll have the Bud Pole qualifying results. We'll also take a look at the Bush race from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and have the latest NASCAR news. All of that and more coming up right here on TNN tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And Stephanie and I will be back with the feature portion of Inside NASCAR right after this. Everyone enjoys listening to birds sing, and now you can bring those happy sounds indoors. We're proud to present the official National Audubon Society's Singing Bird Clock. Each hour is represented by a different bird, which shares its unique song to chime the hour. At 12 o'clock, you'll hear the haunting call of an owl. And each hour throughout the day, a different bird will sing its song. The familiar robin. The melodious wren. The beautiful song sparrow. It's like having your very own Audubon Bird Sanctuary. Each bird song has been authenticated by the National Audubon Society, the world's leading authority on birds. It's the perfect way to learn different bird calls. Mommy, Mommy, that's an Oriole. It sure is, honey. Since we got the singing bird clock, Ashley has a much greater awareness of the world around her. The bird calls are so authentic, you can almost see the Canada geese migrating south. 
or the proud strut of the cardinal. If you like the great outdoors, you'll love the Audubon Singing Bird Clock. It'll fit in perfectly in your family room, make a stunning addition to your kitchen, or blend in with nature's own sounds on your patio. Its accurate quartz movement makes this a timepiece you can rely on, and its built-in light sensor keeps your clock from chiming at night. The official National Audubon Society's Singing Bird Clock is only $19.99 and comes complete with a certificate of authenticity from the Audubon Society. Order now and we'll include this full-color book describing each of the birds on your clock. But wait! You even get these full-function binoculars absolutely free. They feature high-powered variable focus optics and they're adjustable for a custom fit. Order your Audubon Singing Bird Clock now. To order the Singing Bird Clock for $19.99 plus shipping, call 1-800-411-7766. This exclusive offer is not available in stores, so call now, 1-800-411-7766. Sorry, no CODs. Watching TNN, America's country home. Welcome back to the feature portion of Inside NASCAR. I'm Ned Jarrett, along with Stephanie Boyd Derner. We have a lot for you in the balance of the program today, and let's get right into it, Stephanie, and talk about the New Hampshire International Speedway. Tough racetrack, one mile racetrack, tough to pass on. Yeah, but there are a couple of guys who have learned how to pass well. A couple of past winners at the track, that's Rusty Wallace and Ernie Irvin. Well, let's let those guys take us on the inside line around the New Hampshire International Speedway. Loudon is a track that you can run on the bottom most of the time for qualifying and practice. But in the race, you might have to run in the middle because they get a lot of rubber buildup on the racetracks. But Loudon is one of those tracks that um, it's kind of like the straightaways are a little bit too long, so you have to put um, a lot of gear in to get up off the corner because you slow down so much in the corner. But the corners are real flat. There's not a whole lot of banking to, to hold you down into the corner. And many times you can get a real unusual line going right on the bottom and diamond the track way up in the middle of turn one or two to make a last minute turn and shoot across the bottom. If you come up off turn two, um, it's a kind of off camber. So the wall is just sitting right there. You really have to, you know, be careful coming off the turn two. You got a long straightaway. But it all depends what particular shape the track is in. It's very, very heat sensitive. A cool day, you can ride around the bottom. A hot day, the track gets a lot of rubber buildup on it. Always right up on the apron, try to stay in the bottom. Right in the middle of the corner, you let, let it kind of come out a little bit, and then you have a really good shot coming off the turn four. That's some of the places that you get some real good passes. Real good long straightaway and go to start finish line again. And it's been one of the toughest racetracks I've had racing all year long. I finished third there last year, and um, it, it was a tough third. Well, thanks, guys. And Stephanie, now that they're running two races a year at the New Hampshire International Speedway, it gives them an opportunity to get more experience. Yeah, it still is a relatively new racetrack on the tour. They only started running there back in 1993. Last year, they added a second race, so like you said, they can get more experience. But this will only be the sixth annual running of the Jiffy Loop 300 this weekend. Well, let's continue on at the New Hampshire International Speedway as Tyler Potter previews the Jiffy Loop 300. After an unexpected weekend off, the Winston Cup gang returns to action for this Sunday's Jiffy Lube 300 at the New Hampshire International Speedway. It's the first of two races at the Magic Mile. The circuit returns August 30th. Last year's winners were a pair of Jeffs, Burton and Gordon. It was Burton's second career victory and Gordon's tenth and final victory of the 97 season. Interesting, too, that Ken Schrader won both poles at New Hampshire last year. Now, NHIS is fairly new to Winston Cup, six years to be exact. Rusty Wallace won the inaugural event, while Gordon's the only two-time champion, winning his first race back in 1995. 
One year later, Ernie Irvin was in victory lane for the first time since his near-fatal crash of 94. This year's race will no doubt be memorable for Ricky Craven, who makes his return to Winston Cup after missing the last four months with post-concussion syndrome. Certainly, emotionally, it's going to be nice to go home and, and get back in the bud car and that environment. Just getting back in the car was the priority, and, and it didn't matter where it was, but I think that the circumstances bringing all this together, the begin, you know, the early part of July and being back in New England at a place that I've had some success in front of a lot of friends and family, it's, uh, it's like the perfect script. Steve Grissom's looking forward to New Hampshire. Not only is he coming off his best finish of the year, a 10th at Sears Point, but it was last year at the Magic Mile he posted his two best finishes of 97, a pair of fourths. The car has to handle exceptionally good. It's a flat one-mile racetrack, and uh, again, it all comes back to the car handling. And uh, we would say we had a good setup last year, and uh, it worked for us. We've talked about the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, the Bush Series. Well, the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series is in action this weekend, too, at Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And, Stephanie, there's one driver, Tony Reigns, that has been a pleasant surprise on the circuit this year. It has two wins already. Things are really looking up for that team. Yeah, they really are. Of course, they were a two-truck operation last year with Roerig Motorsports. It was Reigns' first season as a rookie driver last year. This year, they're down to one truck, but a one-truck effort really seems to be paying off for sophomore driver Tony Reigns. For much of this year's Craftsman Truck Series, it seems like it's been Ron Hornaday, Jack Sprague, then everybody else. But if you actually look in the win column, right behind Hornaday is the name Tony Reigns. Heading into this weekend's event at Nazareth, Reigns is the only driver besides Hornaday to have more than one win. His two victories have come at I-70 Speedway and at Texas, and they've established the sophomore driver as a true contender. The first two races we were fast, but we didn't finish as well as we'd like to. We had some problems, some ran out of fuel, broke a transmission, thought, you know, geez, here we are, same deal as last year. But um, we've been faster. Uh, we've, we've won a couple races, like you said, and, uh, you know, it, it's just we're, we're kind of getting excited about the fact that now we're, we're able to be involved in the big picture, which is the points. You know, we're fifth right now. We're trying to climb up the ladder, and, uh, you know, hopefully if Sprague and Hornaday have a spot or two where they struggle, we can uh, take advantage of that. When Reigns broke through with his first series win at I-70 last year and only his first season, some people figured it was because he had raced there in ASA where he was that series 1996 champion. And his victory there again this year only solidified that feeling. But when he backed it up with another win at Texas a couple of weeks later, suddenly Reigns was a more legitimate truck driver. You know, Texas is one of the biggest, fastest tracks we run, and, and I think that uh, it shows you that I'm, I'm versatile. You know, I'm not just a one-track driver. Um, I think we had a lot of good runs going last year on different race tracks, and some of the tracks I'd never seen before. So I think all the potential is there. We just need to make it to the end, and, and if we're breaking and not finishing, people don't remember how well you're running during the race. They just remember who won or maybe who finished second. And, and uh, this year, with us being able to finish each and every race, um, you know, we, I mean, we, we won at uh, I-70, Yellow Freight's home track. We won at Texas, uh, home state of Pennzoil. I mean, this is all, you know, working out really well. We just, we'd like to add a couple more victories to that this year and uh, try to win a championship. At the same time Reigns is eyeing a truck series title, he also has designs on Winston Cup. His truck team has put together a limited cup program with plans to eventually move up together full time. But in the three races they've attempted to qualify for so far this year, Reigns has yet to make the show. No, that's pretty well stumped. You know, it, it, it's been pretty frustrating. Um, you know, it's just a limited schedule with Yellow Freight being our associate uh, sponsor on the truck. They had, you know, put a package together where we could run five cup races. And, and you know, we went there. We haven't embarrassed ourselves. We haven't been the slowest car, but we haven't done what we feel we could do. And, and um, you know, it's... It's, uh, it's a tough deal, we knew that, and uh, it, just, it takes experience, it takes some time, and, and we've gone in there with our own group trying to do it ourselves, you know, and we've probably learned a little bit more than what we thought we would, and, and, uh, but you know, I think if, if we could get some uh, sponsorship to run it full time that, uh, you know, ultimately we could get there. I mean, it's, it's taken us a year and a half to get really competitive in the trucks, and you know, you don't really have the luxury of that much time in the Cup Series, but it's going to take that much time, uh, to be honest. So, you know, we'll just keep doing what we can and try to get better each week, and uh, hopefully we'll make it there. But for now, Reigns is concentrating his efforts on making his mark in the Craftsman Truck Series. He's already got three top fives and five top tens through the first ten races of the season. 
but it's the two wins that now have him looking for an even bigger prize. If you got one win, you know, that's, that's a great, great thing. But when you get uh, more than one win and you start creeping up in the points, all of a sudden the wins are nice, but you start looking at the big picture. You think, well, if we keep finishing top fives, top tens every week, and we can win another race, and those guys have a problem, all of a sudden the wins are kind of, they're nice, but you start looking at the end of the year because if you can, if you can end up on top at the end of the year, the championship's worth, you know, I would take a championship with no wins because the championship's a big deal at the end of the year. But at the same time, if I was racing through the season and I was leading the points and I hadn't won, I'd want to win a race, you know. And, and now that we've won two, we can try to take that next step, which is, uh, you know, I in the championship. And, and we're a ways off. We're 200 points out. But like I say, if uh, Jack has a problem with two uh, and we capitalize on it, we could be right there. And if we can't win the championship, then we're going to try and win the most races, which, you know, that's that's another thing to try and do also. But um, every, week, every week that we come to the racetrack, we try to win. Because if you can win the most races, more than likely you'll win the championship. It kind of takes care of itself. Well, Ned, when Tony Rain scored his first career Craftsman Truck Series win last year at I-70, it really was NASCAR history. It was the first time that Dodge had won a major NASCAR race in 20 years. But he won't be helping the Dodge camp any longer because, of course, that team switched to Fords this year. Well, maybe Jimmy Hensley picked up the ball for Dodge. Had that good second-place finish at Milwaukee last week. We'll see how he does at Nazareth. We'll be back with more on Inside NASCAR right after this. Coming up, we'll look at who's hot and who's not midway through the year. Plus, all the silly season seat swapping. And we'll go in focus with Ricky Craven as he gets ready to get back into the number 50 Budweiser Chevy. That's all next when Inside NASCAR returns. You've done the math and figured out that you can consolidate bills and still afford to make some home improvements. But the lenders tell you that you don't have enough equity. Hi, I'm Dan Marino. If this has happened to you, call First Plus Financial at 1-800-510-PLUS. They'll lend you up to 125% of the value of your home, less your first mortgage balance. There's no application fees, and you'll get an answer before you hang up. Don't listen to those other lenders. Call First Plus at 1-800-510-PLUS. It happens every year in some of the most remote stretches of land in Mexico. And in the world of off-road racing, it's truly the whole enchilada. The legendary Baja 1000. A mountain of dust for those who can stand to eat it. And the end of the line for those who can't. That's why more drivers who challenge the Baja rely on the Duralast battery than any other. The same Duralast you can rely on in your car. Because it's the one we stop at AutoZone. The Duralast battery. Power you can depend on. Sunday on TNN Motorsports. Get ready for 300 hard-nosed laps in the Granite State. It's Winston Cup racing from the Magic Mile. New Hampshire International Speedway. A track where nobody gives and everybody takes. Find out who makes the competition disappear and who just goes up in smoke. It's the Jiffy Lube 300 live Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 Pacific on TNN Motorsports. Where can you find expert advice, customer service, and low, low prices on building materials? Burgess Building Supply. During the month of July, save 25% on all premium vinyl siding by Master Shield. Master Shield siding is available in many colors. Give your home a unique look and get lasting protection from durable Master Shield premium vinyl siding. Now 25% off. Visit for Jen's Building Supply and take the worry out of all your building projects. They're located on Main Street in Virgin's, Vermont. Do you often toss and turn at night? Does your back ache in the morning? Now you can sleep better than ever thanks to Select Comfort, the breakthrough that lets you sleep on air. With Select Comfort, you can adjust the firmness from feather soft to extra firm on each side of the bed, all at the touch of a button. Call now and we'll rush you this free Select Comfort video and brochure. No metal coil pressure points, simply a cushion of air to gently contour to your body, support your spine, and you wake up feeling energized. Call now for your free video. The Jiffy Lube 300 at New Hampshire kicks off the second half of the NASCAR Winston Cup season. And Stephanie, if the second half is half as interesting as the first half, we're in for a real ride.
We sure are. So much has happened in the first half of the 1998 season. And when you look back, really the rules changes we saw regarding the Fords at the first of the season, that seems an eternity ago. Dale Earnhardt went in the Daytona 500. And that's not to mention all the driver changes that we've seen so early in the season this year. Yes, yeah, silly season started in the first part of the season as opposed to the second half. Well, Phil Wurz and Tyler Potter takes a look back at the first part of the season. And Phil starts first. The biggest newsmaker of the first half didn't even take place on the track. The Florida wildfires raging out of control since Memorial Day postponed the Pepsi 400 and the first night race at Daytona until October 17th. The fires also forced the first ever postponement of that event. Ironically, at Daytona in February, history was also made on the legendary tri-oval. Dale Earnhardt captured his first Daytona 500 in his 20th try. He called the elusive win one of his most gratifying. And four months later, Earnhardt made more history as he became the first representative of NASCAR to address the prestigious National Press Club. That appearance in the win at Daytona about the only highlights for Richard Childress Racing. With Earnhardt and Mike Skinner struggling for the better part of the season, crew chiefs Larry McReynolds and Kevin Hamlin switched duties, hoping to improve each team. While a Chevy Monte Carlo won the season's first race, plus six others, it was the debut of the Ford Taurus generating plenty of press clippings and controversy early on. Rule changes by NASCAR had the Chevy, Ford, and Pontiac camps clamoring over equality. And more rules adjustments came after Jeff Gordon's win at The Rock. But the Ford Taurus broke through at the next event, the inaugural race at Las Vegas, where Mark Martin celebrated the first win ever by the Ford Taurus. In fact, the Taurus has won seven of the first 16 races of the 98 season. Martin has brought home four wins so far in 98, adding two more teammates and moving his operation down to Charlotte hasn't slowed him. Martin is poised to make another run at his first Winston Cup championship in the second half. Speaking of champions, Jeff Gordon is seeking his third title in the last four years. The 1995 and 97 champion led the points battle after 16 events, and his four first-half wins matches Martin, his latest coming at Sears Point, leaving only four tracks where Gordon has not yet won on the Winston Cup schedule. The feel-good hit of the summer, though, has got to be Jeremy Mayfield. Since joining forces with Rusty Wallace and Penske South Racing, the Michael Cranvis team has been nothing short of surprising and spectacular. Mayfield amazingly has not finished any lower than 23rd this season, has never been lower than 4th in points, and claimed his first ever Winston Cup victory at Pocono. He enters the second half, 40 points behind Jeff Gordon. While multi-car teams have won 13 of the first 16 races so far this season, Dale Jarrett has claimed two for Robert Yates Racing. His wins, coupled with a series tying 10 top fives, has Jarrett poised for another title run. Byron Labonte has flexed his single car muscle twice already in 98. His wins at Atlanta and Talladega have the Interstate Batteries team solidly in the top 10. We'll need more consistency in the second half to contend for a title. One driver with a new team made some news in the first half. Bobby Hamilton won for Morgan McClure Racing in just his eighth start for the team. He dominated the field in taking a short track win at Martinsville. His 13th position in points is the highest among drivers with new teams in 98. The others, John Andretti 16th, and it's Sterling Marlin, Ernie Irvin, Johnny Benson, Chad Little, and Derek Cope. Benson and Little making the move to Roush Racing in the offseason, now Roush with five teams. Both are now enjoying their most productive seasons of Winston Cup. Benson leading the drivers with new teams with seven top ten finishes. And in the rookie chase, Kenny Irwin Jr. leads Kevin LePage and Jerry Nadeau. Now with the first half injury report and a silly season update, here's Tyler Potter. Winston Cup's silly season has really been going on the last several months. Now, to make it easier on you, we're going to run through these changes in numerical order, so here we go. Steve Park's inaugural Winston Cup season came to an abrupt halt in Atlanta following this horrifying crash in practice. Park suffered extensive injuries and has not raced since. Darrell Waltrip has driven from Bristol on. Hut Strickland started the year in the 8th car, but after five DNQs was out of the Savola Brothers Chevy by Dover. Buckshot Jones drove the car there, as well as the following week at Richmond. Ted Musgrave is on his way out at Roush Racing, expecting to be gone by the Brickyard, but don't be surprised if something happens sooner. Darrell Waltrip began 98 in his familiar number 17, but sponsor woes forced him to sell the team to Texas businessman Tim Beverly, who made his Winston Cup debut two weeks ago at Sears Point with driver Ron Hornaday. Expect Waltrip back in the car as early as Indy when Park returns to the one car. Diamond Ridge Motorsports let go Jeff Green in late April, deciding to shut down their Winston Cup operation. Green's bounced between several teams since, including the 46 car most recently at Pocono. 
Like Park, Derek Cope and Mike Skinner were also injured at Atlanta. Cope suffered bruised ribs while Skinner fractured his shoulder blade. Ironically, both drivers crashed at Texas, too. Jeff Green filled in for Cope at Martinsville, while Morgan Shepard relieved Skinner for two races. Mike Dillon drove the 31 at Fontana. Wally Dallenbach was let go from the 46 Felix Sabanis car on April 28th. A trio of drivers have piloted the car since. Shepard, Kevin LePage, and Jeff Green. It's been four months since Ricky Craven last drove the 50 car. After having been diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome, Craven has rehabilitated himself to the point of being able to return to action this weekend in Loudoun. Randy LaJoy saw the most seat time in Craven's absence, although Dallenbach drove the last three races in the 50. Kevin LePage was the most recent driver to Smith. After signing a 30-day contract with Roush Racing, LePage was let go from the 91 car in Sonoma, where Tommy Kendall filled in. Owner Buzz McCall gave David Green the heave-ho from the 96 Caterpillar Chevy following Richmond. Strickland stepped in at both Michigan and Pocono, while Robbie Gordon drove the car at Sears Point. Finally, the number 98 Thorn Apple Valley Ford has seen Rich Bickle behind the wheel since Texas. Greg Sachs was involved in a single car crash that left him with nerve damage. As for crew chief changes, the biggest was without question the Larry McReynolds, Kevin Hamlin switcheroo before Michigan. Larry went to the 31, Kevin to the three team. Elsewhere, Pete Peterson replaced Tim Brewer on the seven car. Bill Ingle did likewise to Jim Long on the 10. Jer Cannon is now the head wrench for the 11. Ditto for Richard Labby on the 28 and Corey Stott on the 40. The 17 team is on its third crew chief with Phil Hammer now calling the shots. Well, that's it to date. If you had a hard time keeping up, don't worry. You've got five more months till we fill you in again. Well, thanks, guys, for that report card. Stephanie, when the NASCAR Winston Cup drivers and teams get to a racetrack, they got somewhat of a ritual that they go through in setting the race cars up. They go out on the track and make some runs and come back in. And they have something they call ride height that they're always interesting in. That ride height is very important. So let's go in tech and find out what it's all about. Hi, I'm Tony Liberati, um, Hendrick Motorsports uh, chassis specialist for the Budweiser car. And uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, the heights that we put on the side of the bodies of the cars. What we do when we roll the car through uh, the inspection, when NASCAR inspects it, we got to get our heights, our quarter panel and our roof heights. Once we do that, we bring the car back to the garage stall and we uh, put a mark on the car as a reference. In this case, it's 24 and a half. And we use that as a reference all during the weekend so we can... Uh, know exactly where the body of the car needs to be. Because of the, 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 uh, the ground and, and the way the garages are, we can't go by our normal frame heights, which are down here, because of the ground. So what we do is we just come up and we put a reference here. It's easy to get to. We just look at it, have the mark right there, and it's real easy to get to. And then when we go to change springs or we go to change and make a, a change on the car, we can always go back to these references. It makes it a whole lot easier for us. Well, it's nice to learn those things, and Stephanie, I guess one of the greatest compliments that we receive is when people tell us that they learn from the show, and we appreciate that. We'll be back and take a look at the career of the late Davey Allison, and we'll also go in focus with Ricky Craven. Stay with us. There's always been pressure in this business. Every single race I've ever run, there's been pressure, and the pressure is the, the, the pressure that you put on yourself to perform, because you don't just do this. You do this because you want to win. Hi, I'm Jim Palmer. The Money Store is so sure they have the best home loan under the sun, they guarantee it. It's the 90-day no-pay. The loan that lets you refinance your home, lower your monthly payments, and take a break from your mortgage for three months. That's right, lower payments and no mortgage for three months. If you find a better deal anywhere in America, we'll refund your money guaranteed. But hurry, this offer ends soon. Call 1-800-LOAN-YES and ask for the 90-day no-pay. Only at the Money Store. This is NASCAR, this is you, and this is us. Hot Wheels Pro Racing will get you this close to the action with Hot Wheels Pro Racing Diecast, the best of NASCAR in three scales. The Legend Series, unsurpassed detail in 64th scale, and Legends to Life with real racing motion and digital sound. If they drive it, we make it. On the track, off the track, in the pits. Investment quality collectibles, because to get them right on this scale, you got to race them on this one. We're Hot Wheels. Our 
competition won't be able to explain when the only four-door rookie in NASCAR starts blowing their doors off. Maybe they should get more doors. Ford Taurus. This NASCAR 50th anniversary moment is brought to you by Exide Battery. The 1989 NASCAR Winston Cup Championship run pitted three of the most successful drivers in the modern era against one another. Dale Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace, and Mark Martin. Over the final few races, the championship was still up for grabs, but the most bizarre incident of all took place in Phoenix when Rusty Wallace was knocked into the wall, keeping him from clinching the title before everybody moved on to Atlanta. Hey guys, who's turning 50? Do I look 50? Hey, I just turned 40. Not me, he's the older one. Older but faster. Yeah, right. Well, who is turning 50? NASCAR is. And Excite NASCAR Select is celebrating with the Big 50 Celebration. Win NASCAR race tickets or the grand prize. An NBA mascot worth $50,000. Thanks, I'll be right back. Uh, hey, they work in it. The Big 50 Celebration. Enter wherever Excite NASCAR Select is sold. Yeah. Oh, well. In the final event of 1989, Dale Earnhardt dominated. Mark Martin lost an engine, and Rusty Wallace had a multitude of problems. Rusty managed, though, to come home 15, making the final point margin 12 over Earnhardt, and for Rusty, it was his one and only NASCAR Winston Cup championship to date. Wallace picked up six wins along the way and $2.2 million in a season that saw the top five all earn more than a million dollars for the first time in history. Welcome back to Inside NASCAR. NASCAR, of course, is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, and as part of that celebration each week, we take a look back at the careers of some of the greats in the sport. It was five years ago this month that Davey Allison lost his life. His last race was at the New Hampshire International Speedway. So we take a look back at the great career of Davey Allison. This weekend marks the fifth year since Davey Allison ran his final Winston Cup race. The race was the Slick 5300 at Loudoun. The date was July 11, 1993. Davey finished the race third. Davey Allison made his full-time Winston Cup debut in 1987, driving the Rainier Lundy Ford Thunderbird. He became the first rookie in Winston Cup history to win two races in his rookie season. He was the first rookie to sit on the front row for the Daytona 500. He finished 21st in points and ran away with the Sears Rookie of the Year honors. But the biggest moment came on July 3rd, 1987, when Davy started the Winston 500 third behind pole sitter Bill Elliott and his dad Bobby. Immediately, Davy started pounding Elliott for the top spot. Then on lap 21, the scariest moment of the season happened when the elder Allison went airborne on the front stretch, tore down part of the catch fence, and nearly landed in the stands. No one, fortunately, was seriously injured. But it was this crash that proved to NASCAR that speeds had to be slowed. As the race wound down, Davey held his composure and held on for his first career victory. Now get this, in only his 14th Winston Cup start. Then just a few weeks later, Davey conquered Dover as he mastered the Monster Mile. Davey Allison may have raced his final race five years ago, but he will always be remembered as a bright and shining star as we celebrate 50 years of NASCAR. Davey Allison really was just in his prime, and Stephanie, you have to wonder what could the man have accomplished in the sport had his life not ended so prematurely. And, of course, he had so much going for himself, including a great young family. Yeah, he really did, and there's a wonderful article out right now in Winston Cup Illustrated. Ben White sat down with Davey's widow Liz and their two children, and he talked to them about how they've been coping since Davey's death. It's really worth reading. Yeah, every fan should get it if they possibly can. We'll be back with more on Inside NASCAR right after this. 
Kellogg Vila, and I want to show you another great innovation in Craftsman hand tools. It's the Craftsman Quick Wrench, exclusively from Sears. The Quick Wrench is a combination wrench with a unique open-end design that makes it work like a ratchet. An ordinary open-end wrench has to be removed and repositioned after every turn. But the Craftsman Quick Wrench stays in continuous contact, making the job faster and easier. It's all because of the simple ratcheting action. And the quick wrench works in both directions, just as fast and just as easy. You don't have to worry about the quick wrench slipping or rounding off nuts and bolts, because both ends have the exclusive Craftsman headlock design. It grips more on the flat sides of the nut or bolt, away from the points, which helps prevent rounding off. The Craftsman quick wrench is precision forged from high carbon tempered steel for a lifetime of durability. The entire six-piece set is only $19.99. And because it's a Craftsman hand tool made in America, it's guaranteed forever. And what about those places where a ratchet and socket won't fit? That's where the quick wrench really comes in handy. It's made to reach right into tight spaces, and the ratcheting action gets the job done in no time. Craftsman made the quick wrench up to 30% longer than conventional wrenches to give you extra leverage, more torque, and extended reach. Use that extra leverage to break bolts loose with the closed end and then quickly finish with the open end. The Craftsman Quick Wrench can be used almost anywhere, in the garage, in the yard, and in your home. No toolbox is complete without a Quick Wrench set. The Quick Wrench is a genuine breakthrough for Craftsman hand tools. Just one more example of how Craftsman makes anything possible. And because it's from Sears, your satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. Call now to order your set of six Craftsman Quick Wrenches and Standard or Metric for only $19.99, plus shipping and handling. Use your Sears card or other credit card and call 1-800-924-7733. That's 1-800-924-7733. Call right now. Next weekend on TNN, it's wall-to-wall -wall racing with the Pennzoil World of Outlaws. And we do mean wall-to-wall. -wall. All the action starts Friday night for the Eldora Class on TNN Motor Madness. And Saturday night, there's more sprint car racing as the Outlaws battle for $50,000 in the 15th Annual Kings Royal. See the Eldora Class Friday night at 8, then the Kings Royal Saturday night at 9, all next weekend on TNN. This is a big weekend for Ricky Craven, who drives the Hendrick Motorsports Budweiser Chevrolet in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. Of course, he's been sitting out for three months with post-concussion syndrome, but he's been anxious to get back behind the wheel of that Chevrolet. He sure has been, and very anxious, in fact. He was so anxious that he started a couple weeks ago in a bush race at Watkins Glen, finished in the top ten. He said it felt terrific to be back in the race car, but he couldn't wait to get back to Winston Cup. Well, let's go in focus with Ricky Craven. Yeah, I know you've waited a long time for this week to come about. How much you've been anticipating getting back in that seat this weekend? Quite a bit, and it seemed like it's been forever. It's really been on the short end of what we anticipated. We knew it would be at least three months, and, and that's pretty much what it's taken. But it seemed like it's been three years, so it's nice to be back. Physically, do you feel ready to go? Yeah, I feel great, and the Watkins Glen race was the last hurdle it, it was the last big test running the whole race and and we had a, a a great day physically you know all all of what we went up there to, to experience uh, or put to rest was left there and that was nice because i did have some apprehension i really did i everything that we worked with in the hospitals and rehab uh, we, we passed, but being in a race car was the real test. Craven finished ninth at Watkins Glen, but then came another test. On Tuesday, we were at Greenville Pickens Speedway in South Carolina when Ricky Craven strapped into the Budweiser Chevy. It was the first time Craven sat at the wheel of the car since beginning his recovery from post-concussion syndrome. After a 10-lap warm-up, Craven turned 66 hot laps. His times were good and consistent, running in the 20.50 to 20.70 range. Now it's just a matter of building up the stamina, getting his rhythm back. Ricky, after three and a half, four months, 66 laps, how'd it feel? Yeah, it felt great. It's off, awfully difficult to explain, you know, or describe. Being out of the car, something that comes natural to you and that you've done for so long, I've done for 17 consecutive years, and then have that uh, taken away, it's quite a withdrawal, but I got it back. You know, <laughs> I was out there running, and I, I would like to have run 500 laps, but uh, 
we just take it a little at a time. We ran uh, 50, 60 laps, and uh, we would work on the car a little bit, and work on the driver a little bit, and then go back out and make a few more runs. Is there a rhythm factor that you have to get back into, and are you concerned about maybe fatigue uh, at Loudon and down the road? Yeah, there really is. There's definitely a, a factor of, of getting back in your element, getting comfortable, your timing, and uh, the fatigue factor is an issue because I work hard with my trainer, I, I, I watch my diet, I do all the things to be a professional athlete, but there's nothing that prepares you or compares to being in the car, the temperatures that exist, and you just need the repetition being in the car the rest of the drivers have been in the car for half a season so that's that's a, a tough to accelerate you know uh i just have to work hard on it we went out there and he just done 66 laps and uh, he was right on i mean he was very consistent and we run to the tires just wore slap out and it's time for a pit stop so you know he's ready to go as far as i'm concerned craven did run the first four races this season before sitting out after finishing 14th at Daytona, his best finish was a top 10 at Rockingham. His last race was the Prime Star 500 in Atlanta. It's been more than a year since Craven crashed at Texas, an accident that eventually led to his long hiatus this season. The absence has allowed Craven to recover, refocus, and reflect. No, I never, ever, ever would want to have to go through what I've gone through the last three and a half months again. But I must say that it's, it's, it's been an interesting period where I've had the opportunity to look at things from a different perspective, uh, maybe from the other side of the fence, so to speak, and things look different. And <laughs> I really appreciate what I have, and, and I miss it, and I miss it bad, and so maybe that'll translate to, you know, better performance and uh, more consistent performance is the key. I've got to ask you, have you ever let that word fear creep into your head as you prepare to get back into that car? Well, there was, uh, when I was going through the problems back in the beginning of the year, there was a great element of concern, but never the fear, because I don't think you could ever strap into the car under those circumstances. And uh, it's fun for me, and I enjoy it, I love it. Uh, I love to compete. And as long as I have that, I probably won't recognize that fear. Uh, I think every driver out there has a split second of fear when they're running 200 miles an hour at Talladega on the car sideways. That's, that's just being a human being. But I think what you're describing doesn't exist because it's the difference between either, be, either doing this or not doing it. Stephanie, I can't imagine what it would be like sitting out three months. I never had to go through that, so I can't imagine what it would be like for a driver. No, it had to be tough, and I know it took a lot of courage for Ricky to do that. I know he was a little bit concerned at first what other drivers were going to think, but he had the courage to stand up and say, look, I think I'm injured, I don't think I should be out there, and he took the time to recover and to come back right. Well, it certainly showed a lot of respect for him and his fellow drivers out there as well. We'll be back with more on the Inside NASCAR right after this. David Green talks with Inside NASCAR about his recent ride change and what it means to his future. My plan is to get back on track as a driver, and that's uh, with Team 34 in Pontiac the rest of the year in Stanley Tools here. Uh, just to get myself back in A1 shape, uh, I thought I was in A shape, but I want to get back in A plus shape. Plus, we'll tell you about four brothers who have made racing their lives. You've heard their names before. Randy, Ryan, Roman, and Robin Pemberton. That's all next week on Inside NASCAR. Prolong withstood the ultimate challenge of sand in the engine, and Al Unser driving a Viper with no oil. Can Prolong engine treatment help extend the life of your engine, which saves you money? What happened when the world's top engine builders, mechanics, and drivers created their own Prolong Challenge? We weren't sure that it was as good as what we saw on television. When we put it through the paces in our shop, we were able to do the, the testing ourselves, and it still lived through what we put it through. Yeah, we were, we were certainly convinced that it was a great product by all means. It was a night and day difference. This stuff is great. This stuff really works. I'm ecstatic about it. Great stuff. It's incredible. It's a step ahead of everyone, I think. Adds a lot of protection. That's all you ever hear. It's unbelievable. Anybody who tries it. We'll never go back to anything else. Since they went for a long, it's been unbelievable. It makes it feel real good knowing that uh, you got prolonged in the car. You too can experience the prolonged protection and performance that these motorsports champions have discovered. Call the number on your screen now and world champion Kenny Bernstein will tell you where to buy prolonged products. Call now. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> it's probably hit you a zillion times by now. You could use a bug flector. Protect your truck from bugs and stones installs quickly and easily. Bug flector from Auto Vent Shade Company, maker of the original vent visor deflector. Major hazard. You left the base without authorization. Proceeded to Burger King and ordered a rodeo burger. I've served this command for a Answer absurd... the question. Did you order the rodeo burger? You're darn right I did. It was flame broiled and delicious. Burger King salutes small soldiers with a tasty new rodeo burger. Cheese, onion rings, bullseye barbecue sauce. Right now part of the 99 cent great taste menu. That rodeo burger, it was pretty tasty, huh? You can't handle the rodeo burger. If you ask us, it just tastes better. <laughs> Husky, the toughest name in tools. Guaranteed forever. Available at the Home Depot. We got snow! We got ice! Somebody pass the salt! Ah, thank you! Introducing Corozex No Rust Locks from Master Lock. What? That's your best shot! Master Locks are tough under fire. You always have to start with the basics, and one of the basics is a good gas, like Chevron with Tecron, because that helps you run your best. Help your car run its best. Use Chevron with Tecron. It sounds kind of simplistic, but it's really true. To show off their renovated rooms, Motel 6 is doing its first big special effects commercial ever. Here goes. Cool. I'm Tom Bodette, and we'll leave the light on for you. You're watching TNN, America's country home. The Inside NASCAR Mailbox is brought to you by Miller Lite. Our question today is from Thomas Redman from Jacksonville, Illinois. How do NASCAR officials come up with the template they use to inspect the race cars? I'm Brian Dehart, Winston Cup Technical Inspector for NASCAR. To answer your question, Thomas, we build these templates using the same contours on any production car. Then these templates are used to ensure that each car in the garage, whether it be a Ford, Chevrolet, or Pontiac, has the same contours on any production car that you'd buy off any showroom floor. Thank you for writing in. If you have a question for the Inside NASCAR mailbox, write us at Inside NASCAR, Post Office Box 240417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224. Or email us at inside.nascar at sunbeltvideo.com. If we use your question on the air, you'll receive this embroidered Miller Lite jacket and a cap and shirt from Chase Authentics, the authentic trackside apparel of NASCAR. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. We hope you enjoyed it. You join us again here on TNN for more on Inside NASCAR. Visit, experience, shop Simpson World, a racer and race fan superstore. Now open in Mooresville, North Carolina, Indianapolis, Indiana, Torrance, California, and opening soon in Hershey, Pennsylvania. For more information, visit our website at simpsonraceproducts.com. Communications provided by Racing Radios, the two-way radio provider of the NASCAR Winston Cup Series, Bush Series, and Craftsman Truck Series.